Can you imagine what it was like to uh, put motors together in the dark ages? It wasn't so very long ago. All motors had to be handmade and then very carefully hand assembled. Let me get this motor to go together here. Of course, today we don't have those problems. There we are. Much of our manufacture of motors, strictly small motors, is done automatically. And we don't have the problem of hand tooling and, and hand composition, if you will. And on top of everything else, why, if you want special motor characteristics, why the engineers have their equations reasonably well worked out, and they merely ask the computer, and the computer tells them how many windings to put on and what positions the magnet should be in, and they will even uh, issue instructions as to how to, uh, you know, how to cut the metals and so forth for the uh, production of the motors. And this modern efficiency, of course, reduces the unit's costs and makes us all wealthier. This is the production of real wealth in our modern society. However, despite the fact that things are so very well organized relative to the manufacture and design of small motors, it's still true that there are lots and lots of engineers who spend all their time trying to manufacture a better mousetrap, if you will, or, you know, trying to make the manufacture of these motors more economical, faster, cheaper, lower the hysteresis losses, and what have you. And it's these gentlemen to whom our comments are addressed, because here they are collecting data, making comparisons between different motor types, in fact, designing experiments. And so that brings us to uh, our particular lecture, and uh, what do you say, uh, we um, spend some time in a quick review. <clears throat> Supposing you were interested in estimating a parameter of some sort, and that parameter uh, could be estimated by a linear statistic, say a mean. And you all know that if I wanted to test a particular hypothesis about the parameter, I would take the statistic minus the parameter and divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic. And here we see it algebraically. And of course, if my parameter were a simple mean, then I would have the average minus the mean divided down by the square root of the variance of that statistic, sigma squared, of course, being the variance of the observations which are, make up a y bar. In many situations, though, in experimental situations particularly, I won't know what the variance of the observations is like, and I'll have to estimate it as well. And under those circumstances, I find myself dealing with the t-deviant, where I would replace um, s squared for sigma squared. Once I do that, of course, z turns into student's t statistic with new degrees of freedom. The new here being uh, based on the number of degrees of freedom in that estimate of the variance. If you didn't want to do a test of significance, if you'd like to uh, perform a, um, uh, an interval estimate for the mean, uh, how would you proceed in that situation? Well, let's say we wanted to make a 95 interval estimate for a parameter, and the parameter was the mean. Then you know that we have to choose the appropriate statistic, plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of the variance of the statistic. This would give us the limits for that parameter. The 1.96 is that value of z, the normal deviant, which leaves, you know, 2.5% of the tail of the curve. Uh, here it is in its pure algebraic form. In our particular case, if we were trying to make an interval statement for the mean, for the mean, the limits would be given by y bar plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of sigma squared over n. And, you know, what happens when you don't know sigma squared? And you're supposed to know the answer to that one. You just replace sigma squared with s squared. And the moment you do that, of course, you have to replace the critical value of z with its corresponding critical value of student's t statistic, that value of t, which leaves 2.5% in the tail. But you have to pick up the right t distribution. And, of course, that would be t with new degrees of freedom. That new, uh, depending on the number of degrees of freedom that went into uh, that estimate of the variance. So much by way of uh, reasonably uh, quick and general review. What I'd like to talk about today is a um, generalization of the use of t to the circumstance in which we're trying to compare two means. And so let's uh, think in terms of a, uh, a, a certain problem. Let's imagine we have an engineer, and uh, he has uh, some ideas on how he can decrease the hysteresis losses or how he can increase the uh, performance of uh, electric motors. Let's say we have electric motors of type A and type B. And we can see our engineer uh, working in the laboratory or on the production floor, uh, getting a collection of motors of type A and another collection of motors of type B, and recording some observations on both types. In this particular instance, uh, he's picked up uh, six observations on motors of type A, and he's picked up uh, five observations on uh, motors of type B. 
Now this is the raw data, and we can encapsulate all the information which rests in these data in a very simple fashion by computing the uh, averages uh, and the estimates of the variance. And we will now see that the average for motors of type A uh, turned out to be 6402, and the average for motor type B is 62.76. And you'll also notice we've taken the precaution here of also estimating the variance. The estimate of the variance for type A motors is 9.815 degrees of freedom, and the estimate of the variance for the type B motors is 2.75, and it has four degrees of freedom. So let's take these data. I've uh, had these data re-recorded here, and we'll put them up so that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, see the information a little bit more clearly. There's the information on the type A motors, and uh, here's the information on the type B motors. And you see the two average performances and the two estimates of the variance. Okay, now behold our, uh, our, uh, our engineer and his problem. He has information on motors of type A, and he has information on motor of type B. And someone might come up and say to you, there just isn't any difference between type A and type B motors. And when you translate an observation like that into the uh, real world of, or into our world of statistics and so on, that means we set up a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that eta A minus eta B is equal to zero. So there's our particular hypothesis. And so what do you say? We take our data and test this hypothesis and see whether or not uh, we can contradict or whether or not we can be led to accept uh, this particular hypothesis. Well, now, fortunately, that parameter is estimable by a linear statistic and substituting away here, we find ourselves, you know, replacing the values in the following equation for the normal deviate. We know that, we've got that hypothesized, no NA, we know NB, the number of observations. But what about sigma squared? Alas, we don't know sigma squared, and so quickly, uh, we'd replace the sigma squared by s squared. And the moment we did that, of course, what happens to the normal deviate? It transfers itself into the student's t deviate with new degrees of freedom. OK, we're in good shape, because we can estimate s squared. And so we have our 11 observations. Let's go ahead and estimate s squared. All right, gang, now watch out for the hook, because I'll show you how to estimate s squared incorrectly first. Before I get to that, let's just quickly look at the formulae for s squared. This is just by way of quick review. We remember there are two ways of getting s squared. And now let's actually put our data together and get the estimate of the variance. Someone might say, well, gee, Stu, you have 11 observations. Why don't you just dump all 11 observations into a calculation and, you know, get s squared? Just compute it. And that's wrong for the following reason. And that is, we have the observations in treatment A, or type A, varying around their mean of eta A. And similarly, we have the observations in type B varying around their mean, eta B. Now, the question is, is eta A, you know, equal to eta B, and hence, is eta A the same as eta B, or are eta A and eta B different? For the moment, just suppose that eta A and eta B are not identical, but are, in fact, different. Then our data have the following characteristic. Here's the variability around the A data the A mean, and here's the variability around the B mean. Now, if I take all these observations and dump them together into an estimate of the variance, the total variability, you see, will be much wider. In other words, the total variability that the data uh, express will be have two causes. The intrinsic variability, okay, and that variability which is due to the possible difference between A to A minus A to B. So if we were to take all 11 observations and combine them into a single estimate of the variance, we'd be getting an inflated estimate of the variance. It'd be an estimate of the variance which was inflated by the possible difference between A to A and A to B. And that's undesirable. So we do not compute S squared in this case based on 10 degrees of freedom, even though we have all 11 observations, because we fear that A to A and A to B are not exactly equal to zero. You think, as you think about it, that's the hypothesis we're testing, but we're pretty darn sure it's not exactly equal to zero, and we'd just like to get an estimate of the variance which was clear of that particular contaminant. Well, now, how would we proceed? Someone else would say, well, golly, Pete, do you've got two estimates of the variance already. And he would be right. I have S squared A equal to 9.81 based on five degrees of freedom. I have S squared B 2.75 based on four degrees of freedom. This guy raises his hand and says, I estimate sigma squared. And this guy says, but I estimate sigma squared. And in point of fact, they're both estimates of sigma squared. But what do you say we combine them? Now, you don't take a simple average in this case. 
This brings us actually to a discussion of weighted averages. Now you recall how weighted averages worked? What would happen if I gave you K averages and asked you to collect them all together and make a grand average? How would you proceed? Well, you'd take the weighted averages, weighted average of all those individual averages and the weights you'd use in each case would be the number of observations. And you'd find yourself actually uh, going through this calculation. If you wanted to combine K estimates of the mean, you'd take each estimate, Y bar one and Y bar two, all the way down to Y bar K. And you'd multiply each one of those Y bars up by the number of observations that entered that average. And so this would be the total under classification one, here'd be the total under classification two, and you total those totals to get the grand total. And then you'd divide down by the total number of observations. And hence, you would have gotten the combined estimate of the mean by taking the weighted average of the individual averages, the weights being the numbers of observations. All right, now, how do we get the uh, best estimate of the variance if we had a collection of variances we wanted to weight together? And we do that very simply. We take the weighted average of the estimates of the variance, the weights being the numbers of degrees of freedom. And so what we have to do in this instance is do that particular calculation, and we see it right here. There we want to combine k estimates of the variance, and here they are, S1 squared, S2 squared, da 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 all the way down to SK squared. And we're going to combine them by weighting them by their respective degrees of freedom. And so we have nu1, S1 squared, nu2, S2 squared, and so forth, summed up, divided down by the sum of the weights, which would be the sum of the degrees of freedom. That would give us something called S squared pooled. Sometimes the statisticians call that the within estimate of the variance. What we've done in this case is gotten an estimate of variance from within each one of the K classifications, and we've combined them into a pooled estimate of the variance. Now, what about our uh, particular problem? Uh, in our particular problem, we have two estimates of variance, S squared A and S squared B, and we want to combine those two into a single estimate of the variance. So let's get the pooled estimate of the variance for our particular problem, and that's easily done. Here's the equation we're going to evoke, S squared pool, and uh, you notice we're taking the weighted average of the two S squares, the weights being their degrees of freedom. And now let's substitute in the numbers and see what we get for our uh, pooled estimate of the variance. Our pooled estimate of the variance in this case is going to be, let's see now, there are um, uh, five degrees of freedom in the first estimate of the variance and four degrees of freedom in the second estimate of the variance, and I wonder what our pooled estimate of the variance will turn out to be. What we're going to do here, here we go, there we have it. 9.81 is the first estimate of the variance, and 2.75 is the second estimate of the variance. And they, one has five degrees of freedom, the other has four for a total of nine degrees of freedom. Our estimate of the variance is going to be 6.67 based on nine degrees of freedom. And where did that nine come from? That nine comes from the total of the degrees of freedom that entered into each of the individual estimates.